right, well, good morning. A couple weeks ago, I don't know if you remember, but I started a part one of two on uh, contending for contentment, all within kind of our series of, of thanks and giving. And I, I said that in a couple weeks, we're going to kind of finish it up. Well, today is that day. We had talked about how contentment is a personal issue. We mentioned that a discontented life is a place we get stuck when we base our contentment on things we can't control. True contentment cannot be achieved by increase or change in our lives. It just cannot happen. And the greatest danger I feel for the discontented heart is not that we're dissatisfied with our circumstances, but that in time we might turn away from God in order to chase our own desires. First Timothy 6 verse 6 says, but godliness with contentment is great gain. So what we landed on that morning was that the secret, there's like a secret starting point of contentment and that is thanksgiving because that's what Paul talked about in Philippians, that he had learned the secret, that he'd been through the worst possible scenarios and situations in life and in all of it he had learned to be content in the Lord. So it is impossible to live a life of contentment without first a heart of thanksgiving. Today is contending for contentment, part two. So we got it, we started it, we're like, yeah, we can be content. We, you know, we understand to be thankful in every situation. But part two is, but how do we keep it going? Like it's one thing to start something, but then, you know, when the feeling dwindles, how do we keep that going? Well, I believe that practice makes perfect in that situation. So contentment is not just a gift that we receive and, oh, I got it. Now I'm content for the rest of my life. But it is actually uh, something that, that we contend for and that a lifestyle that we cultivate. We must choose to have a thankful lens. It's like my gratitude glasses is no good unless I put them on, Right? 1 Thessalonians 5, 16 to 18 says, Be cheerful no matter what. Pray all the time. Thank God no matter what happens. This is the way God wants you to belong to Christ Jesus to live. In everything, give thanks for this is God's will for your life. And I think Craig said this last week. It's not for everything, give thanks. It's in everything give thanks because God's will is for us to be thankful God's will isn't necessarily every situation you find yourself in but he's saying that in it give thanks for what he's doing in your life so how how do we do this how do we cultivate this how do we create this contending for contentment this lifestyle all the time and I, I, there's three three you know points that I'm gonna to hit up that I believe will help us and one is by shifting focus from what we don't have to what we do number two is by gaining perspective it's like it's God's view it's not ours and it's not the world's and by keeping it real number three knowing our true source having our heart anchored in truth what's real So number one, shifting focus. The book of John. In the book of John, it recounts a story of the miracle of the feeding of the 5,000, which was actually probably more like 15 to 20,000 when you consider all the children and the women. And Jesus, in this this miraculous uh, feeding, he takes a moment to help shift the disciples' focus from lack to abundance and from the situation to the Father through thanksgiving. So they're in this situation where there's all these people but no food. And and it is a little bit of a stressful situation. If you've ever been in leadership of an event and you're realizing there's not enough food, you are panicking. It is like the worst fear. It's like, I I think that's sometimes why we (laughs) over-prepare. Because we don't want to run out of food. So here's, you know, these disciples and Jesus. And the disciples are like, this is a problem. We have a lot of people. But the first, the first thing Jesus does is he looks directly at the crowd. He looks around. He's like, I can see the issue. And then he says to Philip, where are we going to buy the bread so all these people can eat? Now, Jesus already knows they're not going to buy bread. 
He already knows the plan of what's going to happen here. It was a test. It was to challenge Philip's focus. What is he thinking about? What is he focused on? And Philip's like, ah, that's a lot of money. <laughs> that's a lot of money. It's a lot of people. And that would be a lot of bread to lug back from wherever we had to go to get it also. There's like not that many of us. Philip looked at the cost. He looked at the extremism of the situation and the obstacles. And then Andrew is there, and Andrew walks up, and he says, well, this kid over here, he has five fish, and he has two loaves of bread. And then he's probably thinking after he said that, that was so stupid to say, because obviously that's not enough. How ridiculous to even mention it. And then Jesus is like, hey, give it here, give it here, get that boy's food, you know, go get that kid, you know. And then they bring him up, and, and he, he just presents it. And then he's like, okay, thank you, Lord, for the fish and the bread. The first thing he does is offer thanksgiving. Not for what was provided for all these people, but for the seed form of that provision. And he gives thanks to God, and then he says, okay, guys, pass it out. Now, I wonder in this situation, because what would that have been like if you were actually there? That, like, they, he hands them, like, the fish and the bread, and he's like, now pass it out. I'd be like, uh, <laughs> like, mm, like, was there a line? Like, because, like, it's only the first couple that's getting this food, you know. And uh, what did it look like as they passed it out and it multiplied in their hands? Like, what, well, like, did a, a fish just appear? Did, like, I, I don't know. These are things I think about. Um, it, it's, it's crazy. See, they, Jesus gave thanks before the miracle, yeah. Yeah. not after. Now, that was a shift in focus. He wasn't looking at what was there, but seeing the potential of what God could do, what he could do. It's a gift of faith and, and, and a and, a God who does miracles. And Craig has probably told this story a few times, but if maybe you haven't heard it or maybe you blocked him out, you know. Sometimes we're up here, we talk so much. I'm sure he have, must block us out sometimes. I mean, just, yeah. So it, it, it's the story of these miracle cookies when we were, um, like, still in college. We were still in Bible college, and we were interning uh, for a summer, and we were helping out in children's ministry. And this was a very, like, crazy radical children's ministry where they went and they would bus kids in uh and one of the places they went to bus kids was from um like the native reservation and there's all these kids and and that day craig and i were supposed to go on the bus to help these kids get home and every time we just give them a cookie they get off the bus to their home and we give them a cookie well we hit we we got the cookies, the bag of cookies, and there wasn't enough because so many kids came that, that Saturday for, for Kids Church, so many that it was just like we didn't make enough cookies. So I think how many short were we in act? 20, that's what I always think of remembering. There was about 20 short that we had 20 more children on the bus than we had cookies. Well, we're not going to like split the cookies or whatever. Well, anyway, we get the cookies, but... We didn't know we were short on cookies. Okay, nobody told us that because we weren't the maker of the cookies, the baker of the cookies, and we weren't the kids' pastor. The kids' pastor knew, the baker of the cookies knew. We, the bus people, we didn't know. Okay, so we couldn't make plans for the cookies. Maybe like kind of like, are you sure you like cookies? How many cookies have you already had today? We could have like rationed them or something. Nobody told us. So Craig, well, he's a little bit of a cookie monster. So he was eating the cookies. So he gets on the bus and he's eating a cookie and he's eating another cookie. I think he ate like two or three cookies. And, and I was waiting just till the end. I was like kind of towards the back of the bus or whatever. And, and then he would, a kid would get, you know, to their home. And they're so excited because it was kind of one of those things. They're so sad to leave kids' church because it was like a really exciting program. You know, and they go home to their homes that are, are challenging and difficult. Um, but because they got a cookie... It was like a little bit exciting, you know, to get off the bus. So they, you know, and he's passing out the cookies, passing out the cookies, passing out the cookies. Anyway, we passed out all the cookies. We delivered all the children and then came back to the church. And we get in. And when we, we come in, the children's pastor runs up to us and she's like, did you have enough cookies? And we're like, well, yeah, we have, we have enough cookies. We actually have extra cookies. Why? 
and she's like, there wasn't, there wasn't enough today. We were about 20 short, but I just, I just prayed over them before they left and said, God, just multiply these cookies. <laughs> Amazing. Thankfulness. God, thank you for these cookies. Thank you that you're using them to put a smile on a child's face and then bless them in your name. And he did. See, when we focus, when our focus is on the one who is the miracle worker, we don't have to consider really what's in our hand because it's irrelevant. Faith is not a mental assent to truth, but it's a relationship of trust in a person. And, and that trust in a person can be counted on every time. See, the enemy, I believe, is hyper aware that if he can get our eyes off of the Father, off of, 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 of God, and on anything else at all in life, he will disable our faith. Because his goals are to distract us, to disconnect us from the Father. When we feel discontent in our lives, we are revealing maybe a lack of connectivity to the Father in some way. Our focus needs to be on him. The degree at which we trust him is the degree at which we can be trusted. So if you feel like, dang, I'm kind of feeling this. I feel a little bit disconnected. Or I feel like he's not at work in my life. Or I feel like a little bit discontent. Then, then, then what should I do here? Start giving thanks. Start giving thanks exactly where you are. Shift your focus. Number two, gaining perspective. It's God's view. It's not ours or the world's. I'm reading a book. It's called The Three Mile Walk by Banning. He's the pastor of Jesus Culture. And he tells this story in one of the chapters. He says this, my friend Zach Curry is one of the most positive people I know. One day, Zach and I drove to the Bay Area with a couple friends and had a great time. But we hit crazy traffic on the way home. Traffic is one of those things that can really wear down my patience. Me too. I hate sitting in traffic, he said, and I cannot see any redeeming quality about it. And just as my frustrations were starting to grow, Zach turned to the rest of us in the car, grinning and said, guys, what a great opportunity to spend more time together. <laughs> he said, I looked at him and thought, are we even in the same car? <laughs> we were. Zach just had a different perspective that led him to focus on different things. Isn't it amazing that the same two people experiencing the same thing can have a completely different outlook because of perspective? The practice of giving thanks shifts our perspective from the negative to the positive like nothing else. There are times in life where things just feel impossible. And we come up directly against situations that we don't know how to face. Many times they just happen to us, and sometimes we make them happen through choices. But in any case, we find ourselves here. In Second Chronicles, there's a story of, of King Jehoshaphat. And there's the three armies that had teamed up, and they were coming again him, against him in one massive attack. And he called the people to pray. And then the, in this 12-word, transformational, powerful prayer, he said this, We don't know what to do. But our eyes are on you. See, the odds were not good for the king, but his perspective was. He's like, I don't have a clue what to do, but I know I'll be okay because my eyes are on you. Have you ever feel that way? I feel that way like every day. <laughs> Honestly, though, I don't know what to do, but my eyes are on you. There's been so many times that's been a deep cry of my heart. And I feel like daily it is a, a prayer. It's not a prayer of devastation, though, of hopelessness. It's a prayer of confidence, I believe. I believe it's a prayer of perspective. I don't know what to do, but my eyes are on you. It's an anticipation that God is about to move in my life. Living a life of contentment through thanksgiving allows us to recognize that the problems are actually opportunities for God to show up. So we can face them with optimism and we can face them with anticipation that he will come through. Perspective. 
gaining perspective, actively asking God, what's your view? So when you're in a situation, God, what's your view? With the news I just heard, what's your view? With the change that's about to take place, what's your view? With what I'm facing right now, this surprise on my life, what's your view? Not mine, not media, not others. What's your view? Perspective. And number three, by keeping it real. By knowing our source, our, our, our reality of our source, and keeping our heart anchored in what's true. I believe that complaining violates the presence of God. The state of oneness with him and the state of our communion with him. You will only complain when you are more aware of the problem than you are of his ability. We need to keep it real. And by keeping it real, I don't mean by what we see, but by, but by what we don't see. Because that is the reality of where we are, what is unseen. See, when, when we're largely aware of our problem, I believe our anxiety just gets heightened in those moments. And, and then by default, we're going to vent and we're going to complain, which brings more of a spotlight on the problem and on our anxiety. And then increases complaining and then that turns into unrest and discontentment because we're in this cycle and we can't seem to get out of it. And, and, and it's, it's difficult to break it. In Philippians 4, verse 6, we read a couple of weeks ago, we read, do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your requests to the Lord. With thanksgiving, we present everything over to him. With gratitude, we just present it all to him and say, God, your lens, your view, your perspective, your focus, how do you look at this? And then it says God's peace will be ours. And he will garrison our thoughts and our minds and center us on him, allowing us to be content with our earthly lot, whatever it is. It'll transcend all of our understanding over our hearts and minds in him. See, there's no room in our lives for complaining. And like, I know, I mean, sometimes it, it, it actually takes up a big room, <laughs> right, in our lives. Because it's just so easy. And there actually is this feeling of like release when you complain or you vent. You're like, well, I feel better now. I can move on. And I totally get that. But I don't know that long term that it's beneficial. I think it's like a short term gain. But long term, I think it actually hurts us. I think also we've justified it because people say to us it's a good thing to vent. Right? We, they, they say, hey, it's good to get it out. It's good to just you know, complain about that, release it, and, it, and it's fine. And then someone said that once to us, and we agreed. <laughs> so now we all do it. But I don't know from a biblical and a godly perspective it's a, if it's actually beneficial to us. I believe that someone somewhere just needs to be like, you know what, I'm going to do it differently. I'm going to choose to do it God's way and see it through God's lens. And I'm going to have a different perspective. And the words of my mouth will be pleasing to him in every way. And instead of complaining, I'm going to speak life into the situation. So instead of just saying the situation and the frustrations, of, I'm going to like have an opposite spirit about it and talk the opposite way about that situation, bringing glory to God in my words and bringing down heaven's focus and perspective. You might be the only one doing this, <laughs> but do it anyway, right? You might be the only one in your home with that perspective, but do it anyway. In your workplace, I mean, that's a hard one. Do it anyway. If our hearts are anchored in him and his word, then we will live a life pleasing to him, and we will see things change in our families, in our workplace. I believe we have a personal responsibility for that. My internal world is not your responsibility. It's mine. And if I'm not living my internal world correctly, it's going to affect you. 
keeping it real doesn't cater to my feelings as they get kind of tangled emotionally and things like that in dissatisfaction. Uh, keeping it real is keeping it connected to the Father, to his work and being thankful. Even when I find myself in a less than ideal situation, you know. Difficulties are opportunities to practice our thanks. And our thanks, as we said, is the first step in contending for a life of contentment. And we stay in that life of contentment by one, shifting focus. It's not what we don't have, it's what we do. By two, gaining perspective. It's God's view, not ours of the world. And by three, keeping it real, knowing the true source and staying anchored in that. That's how, but why? Why? Why contend for contentment? I mean, it's for us, for our personal gain, but I believe it's bigger than that. It's for the world around us. It's for the co-worker that's struggling. It's for the friend that's just lost. It's for the neighbor who wants more out of their life and doesn't know how to get it. It's for our children who need a hero in their family to look up to, a mentor to follow, because they're not getting it at school, and they're not getting it out in, in their playgroups and things like that in their sports teams, so they need someone in their home. And it's, it's, it's a hero that they need to be like, I want to be like you. Someone who reflects the ways of the Lord and reveals the heart of God. That's our why. Because when we live a, a, a life of godly contentment, living his way, we, we are satisfied in his will. And we are the best versions of ourselves we could ever be. Our eyes are fixed. Our joy is complete. Our minds are stayed on him. We are capable and continually able to live a purposeful life. We then live with an eternal perspective. Nothing I contribute in this life that is not of eternal value is a good measure of investment. Okay? I can pour my time, my talents, my efforts, my money, my excitement into things that bring me temporal happiness, a sense of adventure, even, you know, and time fillers, things like that. But if it doesn't follow me beyond the grave, it, it's truly of no permanent value. When I'm content in my life, the day-to-day, -day, the way I live, for eternity, I, uh, will be for eternity. Because I will not be subject to be drawn away by frivolous things in order to fill a void that I will never ever actually fill chasing those things. You see the weird cycle that we get ourselves in? Those things are burned up. The Bible talks about wood, hay, and precious stones. And everything we build our life on, if it's with wood or hay, it gets burned up in the end. But if we choose to build with precious stones, those last forever. Those are eternal. So that's my relationship with Jesus. That's my love of people. That's, that's, that's the people I share Jesus with. That's the people I save and bring into relationship. That's the, the children, my children that I serve in my home. The legacy I leave. That, that's you. That's all of you. The, the parts of my life I give to you. That's what counts. So I don't want to give my life to even a portion of my life to that what's meaningless, that doesn't be, go beyond this moment, because why would I? I don't want to get to the rest of my life, get to the end, and, and be like, I did it wrong. I did it wrong. I chased after all the wrong things. I was in a fight to find contentment in all the wrong places, and I never truly filled my, pur my purpose. I was so distracted. I don't want to get to the end. And wish I could have loved that person better. Why didn't, I, why didn't I love them more? I could have told them about Jesus. I could, I could have had one more moment of free will on this earth just to worship God because I want to. Not because I have to. I, I, could, have, I could have spent more time. I could have encountered him more to, so I could be a light, a bigger light. I could, have, I could have not wasted and whittled away my life on frivolous, meaningless things, chasing my own desires that would always end in discontentment. As I end this morning, I want to show you a clip from a movie, Schindler's List. If you aren't familiar, this is a, a, a movie about a, a German man during World War II who risked everything in order 
to save Jew Jewish people during the Holocaust. And this is the end of, of the movie. Don't move. Piece of curds. I want, um, I want that cloth distributed to the workers. Two and a half meters each. Also, each person is to get a bottle of vodka. They won't drink it. They know its value. Likewise, those Egyptian cigarettes we organize. It'll be done. Everything you ask. I've written a letter trying to explain things in case you were captured. Every worker has signed it. There are 1,100 people who are alive because of you, Okatan. If I made more money. <laughs> I threw away so much money. <laughs> you have no idea. If I just... I will be generations because of what you did. I didn't do enough. Why did I keep the car? Ten people right there. Ten people. Ten more people.
powerful glimpse of a heart who gave. But if he could do it all over again, he would do it better. I wish I could have saved one more. See, when we live free from the pull of the things of the world, of our desires just trying to fill voids, and we choose to live a life of godly contentment, we are positioned to give the most, the best offering to the Lord that I could ever, and the best to others so they can be free, so they can be whole, so they can be saved. The regret of chasing a good life while sacrificing the best life is one I do not want to come one day face to face with. If I'm going to waste my life, I want to waste it all on Jesus. Because in that, there's no regret. Amen? Instead, at the end, we will stand before him, and these are the words you'll hear. Well done, my good and faithful servant. Well done. Why don't we stand? I'm going to pray over you as we close this morning, and I just believe that God wants to meet you where you're at. And and there's never any condemnation in our journey. But there is always opportunity to be pulled into more with him. So if that's your desire, as I pray, I, I just ask you to open up your heart to what he wants to say and what he wants to do. Father, I just pray right now. Over everyone in this room, I pray that your presence would be on them and in them and surround them in this moment. I pray that as you've been speaking your words to them in this time, that you would bring revelation and enlightenment on the work that you have begun and that you will be faithful to complete in their life. I pray that you would give them the courage to be thankful, to have gratitude, even in in the the less than ideal situations, even in the impossible situations, even in the surprise situations, that they would be able to choose to look to you, to have focus where it should be, to have perspective, to keep grounded in the truth of your reality. And that they would understand that there is a better way to live. That we would understand that we can do this better as we lay it at your feet. So God, would you come and would you empower us today to live the best life for you at any cost. I want more of you and I want more of you at any cost. Father, we will pay the price for more. In Jesus' name, amen.